Welcome to Greenvale Radio Episode 4. I'm Dan. And I'm Whitney. And in the run-up to Deadly Premonition 2, A Blessing in Disguise, we've decided to take a look back and plumb the depths of Swery's career. Today, we're going to be talking D4, his attempt to make a Kinect game for the Xbox One that went horribly awry, but would go on to influence Deadly Premonition 2 in at least visual ways, and maybe we'll find out more ways as we go. Also, yeah. there was a surprise cameo by a character in The Missing, which we're going to be talking about next week. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, so, uh, I played this game for review. You can read my review of it on Game Critics. I was not kind to it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was a very nasty review. And I'll tell you why. Um, just right off, if you haven't played the game, is it worth people actually tracking down and playing? Do you think, Whitney? Uh, yes, I, <laughs> I think it would be. It was so, uh, like so you, much hesitation Like you, there. I wasn't, um... I wasn't as impressed. Yeah. Like, I literally, my first time playing it was a couple days ago. <laughs> I played it for stream, and I thought it looked cool. Uh, the I played basically on PC, so I didn't have to do the connect movement stuff. I just had my mouse. And, Thank heavens um, for small favors. So it wasn't that hard to play. I was invested in the story. I was interested in the invested in the mystery, but there were some things about it that kind of just irked me. And right. uh, this is definitely going to be a a spoiler podcast. So if you haven't played D four and you want to check it out, I I mean it's on Steam. It only takes a couple hours. Yeah, it might be worth it if you're a sweary fan just to check it out and see why a lot of people were upset that it was never finished because it really does leave you. At a cliffhanger. So, yeah. So. <laughs> and my main, and I will say this now. So, A, you can go and buy it for what is it, like $20? Uh, I got it on sale for like two bucks. Okay. It so goes yeah. on sale a lot. All right. So, so, yeah. If it's full price now, just wait. It will go on sale. Yeah. You can get it on sale for very reasonable price. Um, I'm not saying it's going to be worth the 20 bucks it normally costs. It's not. I, I wouldn't say buy it for a full yeah. retail just because it's it's not finished yes. and it's probably not going to be finished. So now that we have fully encouraged you to either pick it up if you're a masochist or just watch Whitney's playthrough. Whitney just played through it on this stream. Uh, I, I, I don't, I don't know if you want to watch my playthrough. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't want to uh, watch hers, there's plenty of playthroughs of it online for you to check out. Uh, I made him look like Hitler for a little bit. I was like, no! "Oh my god, I can get a I can get a Hitler mustache. What the fuck is this?" <laughs> yeah, swear he's swear he's got. And some then weird I for, then I forgot I had the Hitler mustache, and I started it up like a day or two later, and I was like, "Oh, oh my god, I forgot he has a Hitler mustache." <laughs> this, this was a bold choice I made yesterday. I got to got to I got to change this. <laughs> Uh, but yes. It's like a joke. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'll say about it is, and this is, I, I think, true. Um, the thing I was hardest on was beyond the super awkward controls, uh, which were very difficult yeah. to use. Like even even with the mouse, sometimes, um, even though I was getting like perfect, great, or good for the most part, sometimes it was hard to get the mouse in the correct position to actually make the movement before time ran out. I can only imagine how awkward it was to with do connect. the connect yes. moves. It, yeah. it was a nightmare. It was terrible trying to wave to wave the controls like it it added nothing and it weirdly just it it ended up distancing you your, uh, yourself from the action you know and I, it's like i've never understood connect as a concept because they're like oh well you're involved more involved in the world but the fact is the controller that we all hold in our hands that we're so used to that we played a hundred games with that controller can do 50 things you know well not 50 but like there's 20 distinct functions on a controller with all of the buttons yeah. and directions you can push. Whereas with my hands, I can wave my white, right hand in a direction and I can wave my left hand in a direction. And that's it. So that's all you, I can you do. You can kick. You can kick too. Oh, yes. You can kick. Well, there's. it was all very awkward to try to do on the Kinect. It didn't work well. And after the first chapter, I switched over to the uh, controller. And the controls were still bad, but at least they weren't torturous. 
So one thing about the controls I, I got a little bit annoyed with, even with the mouse, was yeah. um, you were very limited on where you could move. Right. And it took me a long time to realize that if I held down the middle um, mouse button and moved it, I could look over oh. to a spot, not necessarily that I couldn't see if I moved to the next footstep path. Right. And I was like, how am I supposed to get this uh, medallion over there? I can't. It keeps disappearing behind a seat. Yeah. And I finally, it finally dawned on me to do that. That, and it kind of got annoying after a while to have to reopen doors the same way over and over. Oh, God, I know. Can I just push a button to get through the door, please? (laughs) So that got a little tedious. Uh, Yeah. Uh, And I get like, it's game of trying to simulate. And I mean, that's the thing. It's. It's a thing of Swery's that he really likes is trying to simulate the minutia of life. You know, yeah. making characters eat, making characters bathe, making characters do things like that. And he's like, why shouldn't you have to open every door with an elaborate <laughs> motion all the time? And I'm like, because you got to make it convenient. Somewhere. It wasn't as bad as, I mean, I, I, I've i not played it, but I've seen people complain about this, but with... um. What? Oh my god, I just lost the name. Oh, David it? Cage. Heavy oh, Rain. The, yes, heavy heavy rain. rain, yeah. Oh no, it was not Heavy Rain bad. People were complaining about like the movements you had to do to do a lot of stuff in that game, like sh- even shave. Oh yeah, that was terrible. Um, so at least it wasn't that complicated, but <laughs> that's true. it does get tedious. So go- no going in that it is very heavily on these movements you have to do to get through the world. Yeah. Which makes sense because it is a connect game at first. Exactly. I thought I thought the style, the look of the game was really cool. Oh, yeah. That weird cell shaded, mm-hmm. like the slightly cartoony look with the heavy outlines around all the characters. And yeah. we kind of see it with Deadly Premonition 2 a little bit, but it's less, it's not, it's not as, as intense, heavy. Yeah. But it's still, no, you're right. It's very similar to the look he's going for with Deadly Premonition 2. And what else is kind of awkward, which is a shame, was the voice acting. I felt David's accent was a little bit What is weird. going on with his Boston accent? Thank you. Like, I, I know I know people from Boston. My family, my mom's family is from Boston. And, and it's I'm like, like this Jesus is, Christ. This is not a great Boston <laughs> accent. I'm like, okay, okay, fine. You know, I'll go with it. Um, but that wasn't the only thing that kind of irked me about David. Yeah. I felt his character was gross. I did not like, you know, smoking is gross. Yeah. But yet I didn't find York gross. No. But I find David gross with the way he handles his chewing gum. He just sticks it I on shit. Walls, seats. And Everywhere. Like, what are you doing? Are you a child? Stop <laughs> it. I mean, I agree with you completely. It's very ugh to watch. Yeah. But I mean, everything about him is so, like, gross. Like, he's just such an ugh person to look at. Like, he's, he is, he looks like an unmade bed, to quote a description of Columbo one time. But you, but you know, it, it, it makes sense given his state of mind. Oh, yeah. Why he would, you know, stop caring about his appearance. Oh, I don't fault him. I don't fault that. But I got to say, just just the, the gum chewing and sticking at places and then him and Kaysen and their food interactions really grossed me out. Yeah. Oh, my I'm like, God. This is not funny. This is just gross. <laughs> it's just too much. I'm right there with you on that one. For those who haven't played, um, Kaysen is his former partner. They were on the narcotics team investigating um, real blood and stuff and about. A couple years back. Real Blood being the name of a new drug that is very fancy. Yeah. David Young Henning's wife got murdered in their bathroom and he got shot in the in the head. And before she died, she told him, look for D. Yeah. So that was a person maybe who killed her. And, and he's suffering some sort of maybe amnesia. He cannot remember that night. Yeah. Um, and he quit the force and now he's dedicating all of his time and effort to solving Little Piggy's murder. Yeah. And it's 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 not, not going, going great, great so far. <laughs> but the, I guess a side effect maybe of getting a bullet to the brain, it allows him this this ability to travel back in time <laughs> through objects called mementos. He holds the memento 
and he's able to go back to a certain time where that object played a part in a scene and yeah. he can go in interact with the characters investigate and by the end of the available chapter you find out he can actually influence the past and yeah. that just reinvigorates him to prevent his wife's killing hopefully yeah it's yeah. a very interesting story uh Kaysen seems to be on board with him he doesn't think he's a crazy person mm -hmm. i guess maybe he witnessed him going back in time who knows but he's been at it for a while, and Kaysen's providing him with the different mementos. You see, like, a, a pile of them in the bathroom. And every time he goes back, he returns to the murder scene in the bathtub. Yeah. And there's a connection to this new drug called Real Blood, which is very odd because uh, different versions of it comes out, and people get addicted to one version, but then when they try to take, like, the new one it will kill them yeah and they don't die like like a drug overdose they'll die in extremely weird ways like uh spontaneously combust or lose all their blood i mean it's just very <laughs> yeah, hearing supernatural some, all of the blood exploded out of someone's body was a very disturbing image yeah. and apparently peggy she her blood was drained yeah so we don't know if she was taking real blood or just the Drugged person who with killed it. her yeah yeah no, but there is obvious, there's obviously a connection there. We just don't know what it is yet. So another little thing that kind of weirded me out, and I know it's probably just a wacky, sweary thing. For some reason, David sees his kitty cat as a, a blonde woman in a leotard. And I, I don't understand why we're seeing Amanda the cat as this woman. Who's probably his wife. Amanda the cat? Well, no, no, I'm saying it is who he's seeing it as. Oh, it doesn't look like Peggy to me. I just assumed that it was her, but with, like, blonde now. But yes. No, I just, I, th I thought maybe at most, maybe it was their unborn child. What do you imagine she might have looked like grown up? That's possible. But it I, I, was pretty clear. When I saw the screens, I'm like, what's with his roommate being really weird? And, you know... But then when you start the game, you're like, oh, it's the cat. Why yeah. is he seeing his cat as a human woman in a leotard? Yeah. And, and she does a lot of cute things. And it's like, okay, this is weird seeing a human woman do this. But if it was a cat, I'd be like, oh. All of it makes perfect sense. Yeah, exactly. Look at the cat. <laughs> and and yet he's just sitting there and he's acting like it's a strange woman who's shown up is in his apartment. And it's like, mm -hmm. I don't know why this woman's here. It's very strange because he's suffering from some kind of a bullet related mental break do you think that's cannot... it it's the bullet oh it's got to be that's in bullet. his brain yeah and okay. it's got i mean in the same way that it's like people have had that mental problem where you can't see other people as people right like you there, there's that famous case of someone who had a brain injury and it's like uh i remember the the title of the book was the man who thought his wife uh was a refrigerator you know, like who, who, who literally like, well, she's about, you know, four, uh, she's about five and a half feet tall and she's, you know, three feet, uh, two and a half feet wide. Maybe is she really wide too, yeah, like, built like a fridge. You no, know, she was not really <laughs> wide and built like a fridge. That's not the point of the story, but OK. No, yeah. but the point of the story is like okay. you can have brain damage that makes it so you honestly can't like um, in the same way that synesthesia screws up yeah. your ability to figure out sound versus sight right and mm. suddenly like you can hear colors and see yes. sounds in the same way i feel like some bizarre brain damage caused by the um by the bullet is making him interpret visual data the wrong way and I don't know, I mean, I don't know why psychologically he has transformed a cat into a woman. I can't weigh in on that aspect of it, but I'm pretty sure that's what's going on within the narrative. Okay, that kind of makes sense. Yeah, but you're right that the game doesn't explain it at all. <laughs> I mean, it's, you, you can make an assumption just yeah. based on the first yeah. chapter that came out. Exactly. Um, I, I would have figured it would have been explained later. I would hope so. But then... But then you got, oh, it's just a wacky Japanese game. Okay, whatever. Yeah, no, I think it, I think it all, and that's the thing that I've been taught by being a fan of Swery, which is all of this stuff means something. 
Like yeah. he's never a uh, people watch his stuff. And sometimes they're like, he's weird just to be weird, but everything pays There's off. There's a reason behind it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Everything tends to pay off, especially when you get into um, the missing. And it's like, it's the perfect example of every image in that game is meaningful to the theme of the games. And I really feel like the Catwoman means something, but we don't find out what it is because we never, you know, because then it's the a shame it didn't rest get of the finished. Never maybe, get made. I know. Maybe my opinion of it would have been different if, if the whole game was out. Another thing I felt. Yeah. I, I don't know what irked me is the, is the right term, but term, but I just felt. I was getting annoyed by the characters instead of, you know, being amused. Right. More annoyed than amused. For example, meeting the um, Deborah on the plane and her note taking and being freaked out about everything. She was just annoying. She's a lot. And yeah, I agree with you on that one. She is a lot to take. It just seemed like everyone I met, sorry, I met was like a mean spirited weird if that makes sense yeah no i mean none of the play i I would agree with you that none of the people he encounters on the plane seem particularly likable like they don't they're they're a lot of them are very annoying i think i found oh god who is who is what is the name of avant-garde duncan duncan i kind of i kind of like i kind of like Duncan. (laughs) yeah he's cool (laughs) i I, laughed at him i'm not gonna pretend i'm i'm so cool that i didn't really enjoy duncan like he's He's a lot of fun, but I would agree with I, you. I did like how David's like, how does the mannequin sit down on the seat? <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's a really good question. Because that was question. the question I asked. <laughs> I was like, yeah, wait, how does the mannequin the sit picture? down? How does that work? Uh, no, but it's like he, you know, I find mildly entertaining. He is so broad, so big, so weird. And you constantly going and changing your outfit to try and impress him. Oh, yeah. So that was... <laughs> Like that, I, that I, I missed that. I missed that oh. side mission or whatever, and then I found out you had to actually you were going you you could not complete it in that chapter, and you had to get a shirt and then go back and replay the chapter. Yeah, but yeah. I, no. I never got to complete that. There is a there is a lot of stuff you can do in the game if you play it a second time, and as you saw, there's a ton of there's a huge amount of stuff to unlock, right? So yeah, like yeah. the game is it's pretty dense. And in the same way, swear for is, what it is, for what it is. Yeah. Um, my biggest issue with the game, and we'll get back to the characters in a second, is just that how unbelievably frustrated I was to get to the end of the first chapter. Right. The first, you know, the first of this on ongo- supposed ongoing series and be mm-hmm. like the natural stopping point of this story to break the chapters is to wrap up the plain part of the story right you think because at the yes. start of the story we're saying something happened on this plane there was a disaster on the plane go find out what happened on the plane that is what we're told our goal is and then we get to the end of the game and we don't get to find out what happened on the plane oh we we, we kind of have an idea about what happened but we can't stop it we can't, a, because we, can, we can't either stop it or just even get to the end of it yeah, it stops right before a little boss battle. And, and the thing like, is, it's like, I oh, can't okay. understand the logic of not doing the boss battle and ending the game after the boss fight. That makes perfect sense to me. But I thought stopped. that's what was going to happen. I was pretty surprised. Yeah. Actually, I, I was a- actually a little bit surprised when I was playing it because I thought it was shorter than it was. Oh. I had the feeling that it, it, it ended before the second part of the plane stuff. The, yeah. Um, so I, I was pleasantly surprised that it kept going. I was like, oh, yeah. there's more stuff. But then I was like, oh. You're ending just as we've revealed the villain. Just okay. as the villain is revealed, the game stops. Just as he's like, I've got my bizarre. And I mean, how great is that moment where up until this point, it's just been, it's been about cops. It's been about drugs. It's been about a guy who can maybe travel through time or maybe he's crazy, but probably he is traveling through time. All right. And, mm-hmm. and like all of that. And then suddenly, oh, by the way, uh, the villain you're up against has a weird electro suit. <laughs> it's like, where was he keeping that? I know, this came out of nowhere. It's so audacious and strange for that to happen. 
and you're like, I can't wait for this boss fight. And then the game stops. Yeah, I was like, like how is this going to happen? Is this going to be like fighting Amanda for the baseball? I hope not. I know. But uh, didn't 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 happen. Yeah. Like they stopped exactly exactly when the story was getting going and you're about to get a reveal. The game just stops. And yeah, I'm to this day, I'm still frustrated about it, by the way. I'm so curious about what happened. Why didn't they continue? It's because it didn't do well on the Microsoft yeah. one. I mean, but I mean, zero, I, I would say zero Switch games. Uh, sorry, I'm a Switch. Sorry. Zero Connect games did well. Like the Connect was an unmitigated disaster. Like it made zero dollars. None of the games did well. And I wonder why they chose to do it episodic instead of just finishing the game. I, I would guess the reason they chose to do it episodic was because he was up against the release date of the Connect. Mm. Like the Connect was coming out and they needed they desperately needed games out on the Connect to say that this is a viable platform. And so they're like, we'll give you a game, but you have to have it out you know, around the launch of the Kinect, or like soon after the launch of the Connect, so we can sell it to people, right? So we can use it to help sell the Connect. But then he's like, okay, well, I'll do it episodically. I'll do the first chapter with the Connect, and then you give me a year and I'll do the rest of the game and blah, 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 blah. But then the Connect mm-hmm. didn't sell and the game didn't sell and boom. It just, it never ended up happening. And then Swery quit gaming. Yeah. And his health. Yeah. And then he took uh, his break. came back to gaming. Yeah. And everything got beautiful again. And he created what? one of the best games of 2018, The Missing. Yeah. But he needed, he obviously needed that break. And what's kind of funny is Access Game, up to that point, was still advertising D4, like, to buy it and play it. And I was like, you're not even going to finish it, guys. Why? What are you doing? You're just, you're setting people up to get pissed off at you. They kept they kept advertising the soundtrack on their Twitter. It's a pretty good sound. Like, I mean, it's a pretty good. How about soundtrack. you give us episode two? I know. Well, I mean, there is a, uh, yeah. the question is who owns the rights to D four, right? Like Access because Games. I, I think Access Games, but I mean, could would they be willing to team up with White Owls and finish it if he wanted to after all the projects I, he's doing now? Maybe. I mean, there's enough. I swear he got to the point where people were bothering him about D4. And when he announced, like, The Missing and um, The Good Life, people were like, why don't you finish D4 first? What's up with you? And he's like, I have nothing to do with that. Yeah, because he's not connected to it anymore. Yeah, he started blocking people who ever asked him about D4. There's obviously a fan base wanting a conclusion. Oh, totally. So, and they're already working with him for Deadly Premonition 2. Yeah, so hopefully whatever the break between him and Access Games was, hopefully that has been settled, right? And maybe he'll come back and finish it at some point. Because it's one of those situations where I think, I I assume he knows where the story was going. Oh, he said he knew. Like, I remember... He's got it all. He teased during the Good Life um, Kickstarter that if they reached a million or something, he would... uh, Tell he people would how, tell the, everybody how the how D4 ended. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. Oh, that's yeah. so good. You know what? The weird part is if he just wants to write a novella, I'll just buy the novella. Like if you don't want to spend the money to make a video game, just write a novel about it and I will just like read that because mm-hmm. I want to know how this story ends. Because like you said, the characters are a little off-putting and the world is a little weird. Uh, but it's a really interesting story. There's this mysterious drug. There's this guy with this strange superpower slash mental disorder, right? Like there's the the time traveling stuff. There's a crazy electric supervillain. Like one thing after another, there's just these amazing, strange things all piled up next to each other. It's such an interesting world. And I'm kind of psyched to find out if like it was all going somewhere like is it all just beautiful um what do you call it? is it all just like beautiful um scenery or is this all leading somewhere and when is the other shoe gonna drop in exactly. case he's revealed as a bad guy <laughs> i know i mean he's been in a couple of games and he was a bad guy both times so did you did you spot the red seeds at the bathtub yes yeah. and red blood like with the red powder yep. i'm like is it 
Is it the it's same drug? Name? I know. Is new blood? Yeah. Uh, is it is it the same drug as the Red Seeds drug? And this is all connected? Mm-hmm. I was kind of hoping it was, but I have no evidence of and that. What's, what's with um, Olivia looking just like little Piggy? It was like a Silent Hill 2 situation. Here. I know, right? Like, it's really weird. Oh, God. One thing oh, that... so little Piggy's dad kind of seemed sinister. Oh, he's unbelievably too. sinister. I mean, it ends with him and Kaysen being up to something. And we don't know exactly what it is yet, but little Peggy is like, and again, it's, it's that fun thing he does with nicknames and stuff like that, where people will have these weird things. Like she's only referred to as little Peggy. Like that's so strange. Yeah. It's a little bit weird. (laughs) Yeah. But I love it, but it is like legit strange, you know? Uh, So yeah, I don't know exactly what's going on with that. And again, maybe we'll never find out, which would really suck if we never find out. But like, there's so many little details like that that make the world so incredibly interesting. You know, and that's what I loved about it is there's like, he's stuck away. He has become a shut in and he psychically investigates things. Just the idea of that is such a fun thing. But he's like, he goes through this time tunnel in his head using the advantage given to him by his brain injury to travel to these bizarre fantasy places and but and then change the past when he's there. That could be oh, that could be going someplace so fascinating in a subsequent episode. And I just I, I loathe to think that it's never going to happen because there is a chance it's never going to happen. So I'm kind of wondering if with Deadly Premonition 2, if this means that David's stuck in time, like, oh, I don't know, like Quantum Leap. That would be and weird. That's why Zach's in his apartment. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if the fact that he's in, like, he if he were actually in David's apartment, if, like, if it's not just a joke for us, the fans, and it's not just a reference, what if, for whatever reason... He's actually living in David's apartment and that plays into the plot somehow. Uh, I think I think it will. I mean, I made me my hope. Well, I guess my hope is that Deadly Premonition 2 will provide some closure to D4. Yeah. So that would be something. ideal. That would be ideal if we got if, if not complete closure, then at least some clue as to what might be coming if he ever continues it. Which, again, you're right, he might never continue it, but, you know, if if he could just give us some hints in the direction of where it's going, that would be all I need. You know, I don't need much. I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not, I don't think I'm unfairly demanding. I just, I want some kind of resolution because it's such a captivating yeah. world. Right from the unbelievably strange start out at a frozen lake. Yeah, where you punch an owl. (laughs) Just keep (laughs) punching those owls until you get all the metal. I love how like the thing you just you just had to keep pushing people to get some points. Mm -hmm. (laughs) One thing that bothered me about the um uh, about uh, David right is for the most part his investigation is interesting, well done. But then when he looks at her notebook and it's like, oh, the doctor was called in to deal with an emergency brain surgery. Oh, I wonder who they're talking about. (laughs) Really, David? You can't figure out that that's talking about you and your brain surgery? Yeah. Oh, what's with the Suri? He's he's reusing some words. She kept talking about Dr. Johnson. I'm like, damn it, Usha, why are you being a... I know. Like, having those names. Did, uh, like, did he move from Greenvale again? Is it a... Is it a link? And then... I will admit it took me longer than I'd like to to realize that the um, that the doctor was, of course, just the doctor from his brain surgery, that the giant mm-hmm. scary man, like I did not immediately connect. He to the was fact creepy. That he's so creepy. And I'm like, why does this dude keep staring at me? Yeah. <laughs> and it's because, and then when you get yeah please. when you get under the plane and then he's just standing, just standing there and there. he decides, well, I'm gonna go through the vent now and just. <laughs> Just like what the fuck yep well and i mean that is the that is the strange part of it where it's like you start wondering well how much of this is really happening you know <laughs> because the doctor from his brain surgery wasn't actually on the plane i'm pretty sure no, of that he even, he, he even he even said so no uh, olivia can't see me i'm just in your, your i'm mind. just in your mind exactly oh i just gotta say 
That was so frustrating talking to him. I'm glad there was a skip button where I could just see the, the subtitles to move on because that is one of my, uh, I guess, a pet peeve is when people talk like so, this. so slowly. I know, agonizingly slowly. I'm like, spit it out, creepy doctor. Come on. I am right with you on that one. It was super frustrating. But it's. You a, know what else was kind of frustrating was those quizzes about planes. See, like, I know it's crazy, ugh. but I actually really enjoyed the quizzes. <laughs> like, I get that you're one hundred percent right that it's out of nowhere, but then again, you know, doing a strange trivia sequence just feels so sweary to me. No, but like, that's now fine. It's a but, they, again. but 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 we do two of them, I and know. it's not it's multiple times to get through it. I know. Like, it is. Oh, it's you got to answer five. No, be. now you got to answer ten. Now you got to answer twenty. Oh, another. Here's a phone one. You got to answer another ten. <laughs> oh, just kidding. An extra five now. It's like oh. God. I know it. It got old fast. I'm not going to disagree with you on that front. Yeah, and then like if you got one wrong, then you had to go through all the answers again. again. Yeah. But at least, at least they did show you what the correct answer that you answered. So yeah. You they, I mean, there was fast. there was a couple of efforts to speed it along and not make it too tedious but you're right that not enough done was uh was done to smooth that out it's it is a very annoying sequence in the game i did like the the catch the clover game that was fun yeah that was cute when we suddenly like do uh and i mean it's the kind of weird thing where uh by that point i had been playing it entirely on the controller right i had switched over to the controller but I, I mm. feel like that actually would have worked well. I mean, I hope it worked well with a mouse. It makes sense that it would. But that's oh, yeah. the weird kind of easy. thing that was kind of hard with the controller. And I feel like that is the one mini game that would work better with Connect than it would with uh, the controller. Because you're just mm -hmm. reaching out and touching the things. So, yeah, I think that, yeah, that, that was fun. Yeah, that, that was a nice addition. I did enjoy that. But yeah, like putting in all of these mini games and... It's just something he's obviously passionate about, like mixing up the gameplay, not just being walking around, searching things, talking to people, but like actually doing something strange and interesting. Also, why is your cat on the plane? Yeah, I, I, when I got on there, I'm like, is this supposed to be Amanda on the plane? Yeah. Or... Because she's selling me shit. So I assume this is Amanda. I know, but I guess it's Amanda. But why is she on the plane? <laughs> Well, yeah. it's one of the like many, every time he, many strange Every choices. time he goes back, he brings his cat with him. Yes, exactly. Apparently his cat can also travel through time and space. But yeah, like, so it's I got to ask you, oh, did please. you, uh, did you, did you make everybody look like Deadly Premonition characters? Because I did. No, I didn't. I did it a couple of times, but I didn't do it with everybody. That was such a nice Easter egg for us fans. I was like, Amanda, you're Willie. I know. You got, you got to be Willie and you're Kaysen and Olivia, I guess, is Emily. Yep. Okay. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, it was so nice of them to put in that bonus feature where all of the characters have deadly premonition costumes. Like, mm -hmm. such a nice touch. But again, he knows who his fans are, right? He knows that we are obsessive fans of this stuff and we are desperate to, like, have every possible nod to it. And that's where we end up with this weird thing where it's like, are these just nods in the same way that he's reusing characters from characters and concepts from spy fiction and Deadly Premonition? Or is it actually meaningful this time? And it is. He is trying to suggest there is a connection between these two worlds beyond just thematic connections. I mean, I could see the real blood being connected to the Red Seeds. It would be, But yeah. I think the costumes and stuff are just a... A fun note oh no but obviously you're, you're obviously right that the costume but i'm just saying the fact that he has so many easter eggs makes me wonder if he wants us to see these two things as related and i think the blood suggests that it is but again i don't have any proof because the game never got finished <laughs> it's it's frustrating <sighs> but i love it um it's i i gave it a, it's one of those things where I didn't give it a good review, but I I liked the experience right up until it massively pissed me off at the end. There's frustrations here and there, and you're right that the characters just aren't as likable and engaging as the Deadly Premonition mm -hmm. characters are. That's just, you're absolutely right. Um, there's, and I think part of it is just, um, beyond the uh, beyond just the actual things they say and who their characters are, 
Um, I think part of the thing that made York so wonderful as a character is how even tempered he is and how calm he is and how polite he is with everybody. You know, and yeah, he, he I mean, he'll he'll go until off. he blows smoke in their face, <laughs> <laughs> except when he's blowing smoke in their face. But no, generally and calling them um, calling them bad cops. Yeah. I mean, you're right. About he, that. he has he has his moments, but for the most part, yes, yes he is he's, polite. He's very and polite, calm. and he's very calm, and he's very and as a result, everyone with him, even when there are people who are hostile with him, it still ends up being an interesting interaction because you have this completely different energy coming off of York than the people around him. That is almost almost like he is a step back from everybody else, which of course late game reveals prove he is. Like, mm -hmm. all of this isn't real for him the same way it is for all the other people. And I think part of the, the big shift with David here is David is kind of hostile all the time. You know, there's just a little yeah. bit of hostility to his all of his interactions with people. And I think that wears on me after a while. I think I think that was the case with me, too. It's just... It's every interaction seemed very judgy and or, you know, like you said, hostile. Yeah. And, and I don't blame him for like. Oh, absolutely. Deborah. She, she was <laughs> really crazy. Yeah, she's but the worst. It's like he went out. He went out of his way a lot of times to antagonize the person he was talking to. Yeah. And, and I don't know if that was like a detective tactic to maybe make him slip up to say something. Oh, it, it that could they be. And I mean, said. let's face it, uh, you know. More uh, York Morgan does that a few times as well, but I feel like it's weird that his David's only playbook, like the only play in his book, is harass people until they do something. <laughs> you know, like that's his only yeah. move that we see him use, and he uses it over and over again, and it gets tiresome. Like I think it really does from a from just a viewer standpoint. Yeah, I mean, in Kason, he seemed pretty cool except yeah. when he ate i know so disgusting it's hard to watch yeah i turned i turned away especially the part where he i guess he was making steak and he had a skewer and he's like stuffed the skewer down his throat like he I was know. a nice swallower or sword swall sword swaller and i'm like oh god yeah and i'm like is he an is he also a demon like what is it happening seemed, the here? way he ate the way he ate, it was like, that guy is supernatural. And then here's David pouring tequila into his cereal. And I'm like, oh, God. I know. Yeah. It's weird Us. because Deadly Premonition has this fascination with food. And then to see that fascination with food repeated and kind of perverted. It kind of it. It reminds me a bit of like um, Shaggy and Scooby, except just gross. Yeah, it's not played for comedy. It's just unpleasant to watch shaggy and scooby would make weird combination items and eat it in like comedic ways yeah and they would down it all like... whole and this is like what if we tried to show what Sh Sh shaggy and scooby did but a real person was doing it oh it would be deeply visually troubling to watch yeah at least he wore a bib <laughs> i guess but yeah it's like he almost seems like a monster and like one was like very sexual in nature. Yeah. When he was rolling up the pancake and then white stuff came out I of it, know. it looked like he was. Yeah. And I was watching it and I went, "Oh God, my mind is dirty." Oh God. No, no, that's that that's so not you. That's the game. No, you are not <sighs> interpreting this wrong. <laughs> no, I'm one. I'm one hundred percent sure that was intentional, and it was supposed to be troubling for the audience. <laughs> Oh, what did you think of uh, the little cartoon, the little cat cartoon that was sort of like a Sherlock? Yeah, I was trying. That was neat, but you didn't see a lot of it. No, it just appeared a little bit. And I'm like, I it's one of those things where it's so weird and it's so interesting. And yet it never really pays off. And I kept waiting for it to. But I think it's one of those things that would have paid off later if it had had a chance to. Mm -hmm. Like, I really get that sense. You think hockey would have played off at some point? I hope so, but I doubt it. Some sort of fight with, like, maybe fighting someone on the ice rink. and. <laughs> oh, that would have been cool. But yeah, all the hockey stuff was weird. Well, it's Boston. They're it is into Boston. Hockey. They, they love their Bruins down there. 
don't even know what a broom yeah, is. Like, oh yeah, like I don't either. Is it is it a type of animal? Like <laughs> I don't know what a Bruin is. I just know that that's the name of their team. But yeah, it's I mean, is it just Swery's love of verisimilitude? It was like, well, of course he's a hockey fan. He's from uh Boston. Or is it again, was it going somewhere? And you want to imagine that everything's going somewhere because that's his brand historically. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know sometimes I'm one of those people who can put too much faith in Swery and what Swery's doing and assume that it's like it's all part of a master plan. Uh, But it's only because Deadly Premonition is such a, like, a perfectly squared away story. Like, as we've talked about, and people are going to see our video on the other world soon, that there's there's stuff that's left unexplained. But even the stuff that's left unexplained, there's plenty of clues. And you can remain confident that the people who wrote it know exactly what's happening. And when, like, they're not just making it up as they go along. This isn't, um, oh God, I'm blank. Um, this isn't lost. They're not just making it up <laughs> as they go along and they're like, we'll figure it out later. Like, no, this is oh, all Oh, here's mean. a smoke monster. Yeah. <laughs> oh, look, there's, there's a good and a bad god kind of working against each other on this island. I know. Oh, God. Uh. <sighs> that, well, I mean, I think I think our feelings about Lost are pretty clear. Uh, it's not a good show, is our feeling about I liked it, but I, I liked I watching it. It was kind of, it was There's no payoff. There's there's never any payoff, and that's what makes it unbelievably frustrating when you get to the end. There's a lot like, of mysteries that weren't solved, but that's like a J.J. Abrams. Well, thing. I mean, his whole like book, his box. insane belief is you don't have to have a solution. People just want to think there's a mystery. And I'm like, you're I want a bad solution. at this, J.J. Abrams. <laughs> you're just bad at this. <sighs> No, like the the solution, it's better when there's a good solution. And I think the fact that it's like the final nail in the coffin of his theory is that does anybody talk about Lost anymore? No. No, Lost has completely disappeared from the cultural zeitgeist because everyone was so pissed off by what a bad ending it has. Sometimes I see like articles now and then going, oh, the ending wasn't that bad. I know, right? But no, it And they it explain wasn't. it. It was. The whole last year was kind of a waste. And then when you realize that, no, they never really had any idea what they were doing. It was very frustrating. Despite what despite what they said. Yeah, yeah. that was that was a little bit of a letdown. It is. But and I think Swery has earned our goodwill. And I think that this wasn't just, you know, uh, being done on the fly. And I think there was going to be a payoff for D4. And I think the clue and I the sad part is with Deadly Premonition, if you keep playing it and you keep looking for the clues about the character relationships, about how the world's work world works, a huge amount of stuff is there for you to find out. Right. Yeah. There's a giant amount of stuff. And the sad part about D4 is we can't do that. We can't do that kind of a close reading of D4 and look at all of the hints and all of the clues and figure out what was going on. Because the information just isn't there yet. No, it's Ugh. incomplete. It's so frustrating. Which is a shame. It is. I mean, it could have been, uh, it could have been, I'm not going to say it was going to be amazing. I'm not going to say it was going to be his best work. I'm not going to be crazily hyperbolic. But I honestly believe that there was going to be something very interesting here. You know? Um, have you have you played through Spy Fiction yet? Uh, no, I'm playing through it right now. Yeah. I I wasn't a fan of that one either. <laughs> oh. uh, you don't uh, think... So 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 far right now, all I I really like Deadly Premonition and I liked The Missing. Yeah, um, but uh, we're not one hundred percent, and that's I think that's the thing. I didn't um I was not a huge fan of spy fiction when I first played it to the point that I never actually finished the game. It's really goofy, and I I can see some parallels, I guess, to Deadly Premonition. Oh, absolutely, but and I mean we'll it, talk it's, about it's that very... more. Now. A very different show. kind of genre in terms of storytelling yeah. and whatnot. It's it's really different. It's than a completely what different kind of story. Did. Yeah, it's a Metal Gear ripoff <laughs> instead of a Twin Peaks ripoff. I know. <laughs> yeah, and he's not like he's fundamentally not doing his own thing. It's clearly like he's got some weird stuff and he's got some fun stuff, but fundamentally he's just been like. I got to make an action game. So this is the action game. Uh, this uh, sorry, stealth action game that I'm making. 
And on one level, mm-hmm. like, that's fine. But since you know what the man's capable of with Deadly Premonition, you want him to be able to stretch his legs every time. It's like, didn't he also make a, um, uh, what is it, uh, a Monster Hunter style game? I think so, yeah. Yeah, like, and that's something we're probably going to have to take a look at at some point until it turns out it has zero story of any kind and it's literally just Monster Hunter. But it's like he also worked on a Monster Hunter type game. So it's like... He also worked on Extermination. Which, um, yeah, okay, I've really got to load up Extermination to see if there's anything there. But, I mean, I, I from what I've seen, there's he wasn't a huge part he of it. He didn't direct game, it. So. He just, he wrote the no. script? Is that it? He, I, I think he helped with the scenarios. Yeah, okay. So there you go. And there's some, there is some weird sweary things. Like there is a sweary 65 bar in the Antarctic. <laughs> and apparently, um, Kaysen's name appears somewhere. Um, but there isn't a character model that looks like Kaysen. I gotta there load this. Article, I, okay, that's it. I gotta load this thing up. An interview, um, from, I don't know, after Deadly Permission's release, or maybe it was just before the director's cut release, someone was asking him about Kaysen, and he said how that this is, how he kind of puts his little mark to show that it's a game he was part of, he made. And he they, they mentioned that it, he was an extermination, and I sat through someone's Let's Play trying to find someone who looked like Kaysen, and I, I'm like, Sweary, please, where, where is, is Kaysen in this game? And he's like, I think it's like a name or something. I'm like, <laughs> Thanks so okay. much. Super helpful. <laughs> it's an it's someone's like it's like written down. It's yeah, not one an of actual the files character or something. There's I mean, I something. found the bar, which is which is cool to see. I mean, and there's a sweary um, casino type thing in spy fiction. Yeah. So yeah, no, but I mean, he's I always like, I like that. Like one he too. has his trademarks, right? Mm-hmm. And he's always, I mean, he's always been that way. He's always had his trademarks. And the question you end up asking is, it's like, well, as always, how me, like, is it just his nod to us, the fans, or is he trying to build something more coherent? Is he trying to build a greater oeuvre? Ugh. I know. <laughs> I think, I'm a little honestly, ashamed. Honestly, I think, the, I think, I think the, the, the bars, sweary 65 bars and stuff, it's just a little funny Oh, absolutely. Joke. No, I don't his name? I think sure. it's supposed to... But, like, you know. the fact that he keeps... Uh, what I, I guess what I'm trying to say is the fact that Kaysen keeps showing up in games and the fact that he plays a similar role in a, bu- in a couple of those games. I mean, not exactly similar, but he does similar things and there is a weird... Um, well... In, uh, but, I mean... Right down to the fact that in this one... He's not the same in The Missing, though. No, th- that's he's true. He's like a helpful... Yes, he's a completely... F, uh, FK is wonderfully helpful in The Missing. But in the other mm-hmm. games, the ones where he looks like him, uh, where he looks like him, he's mm-hmm. weirdly sinister. Right? Even in yeah, this yeah, game... I and I go back to, well, what was his main characteristic in, um, in, uh, in Deadly Premonition? is the way Kaysen is this creature, you know, uh, this creature of lust who has these big appetites and is just mm-hmm. creepy and consuming things. And, um, you know, again, uh, very sexually involved and motivated. He's, in he's like this. He's a seven deadly sins. Exactly. And, by, and this time he's like, it's Kaysen's back, but this time he's a glutton. Right. Yeah. And so, so, like so almost lasciviously digging into food you know you could say Kaysen and deadly premonition was also gluttonous as well too because he, he would make comments about not being able to stop eating yeah but no there's lines but here knows. you actually see him just you know going oh, to God. town on this food if, I'm, I'm so glad that that wasn't the case i know that sorry i mentioned oh, shit i can't remember when which interview right but i remember someone he said that he really wanted to do more like food scenes so when you ordered something at the bar or restaurant you'd see york eat instead of just a black screen oh and an apple crunch i'm i'm worried that (laughs) york might have been a really weird looking eater i know (laughs) oh my god i wonder if that's made it into part two (laughs) just him chowing down I, I'm assuming we're going to get those eating scenes because that was something he wanted. And I, oh, um, did you see the, the, um, the 
product page on Nintendo um, Europe. Yes, I did. There was like more information. It seems like there's no cars. Yeah. We're gonna, and we you are might just, gonna just be... be skateboarding. Mm-hmm. Which, by the way, I'm 100% fine with. I, I'm one thing I'm not fine with is how my timeline is now fucked up. What? What do you because mean? Because they're saying that Deadly Premonition One took place in 2010. No, no, I'm sure that's just a typo. Oh, you think? I hope so. I, I because think it's just a typo. There's so no, I think like there's so the Pearson, so much in-game evidence that points to 2006. No, it is two. No, no, it's got to be 2000s. I mean, unless they're retconning it. But the fact is, I mean, they're they're trying to say like. <sighs> I don't know. The way they're writing it is that this prequel's 2005. Yeah. Then 2010, Greenville happens. And then 2019 is the stuff with Zach. Okay, but here's what I'm going to say. Um, I understand why you're nervous. I'm nervous too, okay? Because that sounds crazy. But I would suggest that that is... I mean, because we're talking literally just about the text on the page. Right, because I didn't read that, but it's we're just talking but about. But even like, like said that on the on the like press releases too, and I'm just wondering if this is like a PR like mess up. Yeah, no, what? I think it could I, be this weird situation where PR just looks. Oh well, Deadly Premonition came out in 2010, so obviously it must be set in 2010, and they didn't think about it any further than that. That wouldn't. Because I really me can't see Swery just doing that because no. he's so meticulous on all these other areas. And I know originally this game was meant to come out in like 2007. Yeah. You know, so it would make sense that it was set in 2006, like a, a, a more recent time when the game came oh, out. Oh, absolutely. Um, but then it got pushed to 2010. I just think that if in Deadly Premonition 2, if, if that is rolled back to, no, just kidding. It didn't happen in 2006. It happened in 2010. Yeah, that screws everything up everything. just. And, and I, I was told <laughs> on um, <laughs> the Deadly Premonition Discord group yeah. part of Friendly Premonition, uh, we, <laughs> I, I mentioned this. And so I was like, well, you know, you can't look too hard at this. You know, I'm sure Swery didn't expect people to, you know, figure it out. But I'm like, this is one thing that they were pretty clear on. Oh, they yeah. went this isn't the 50 obscure. years ago. And then here's this file that's in 19... Um, 56. 56. Yeah, no, no. They are 100% clear about what year it is set. So I'm just putting out there, if the game retcons the 2006 thing, I'm going to be a sad person. Me too. But <laughs> like, I don't see why they would. Like, there's no reason to. I I think that's probably just an error by whoever wrote that uh, that file. Well, do you think Swery forgot? No, I don't think Swery forgot. I think he had nothing to do. I mean, Swery barely speaks English. He didn't write the European Nintendo store page. No, <laughs> he's he's actually really good now. Remember I what know, Jeff I said? He, he's he's, a, he's a very lot. good now. But I'm just saying there's no way he's putting in the kind of like time to write those documents himself. A PR person wrote that. But they might be going off of like His what notes. is said in in the game. That's I mean, they might be, but honestly, PR people almost and this is just a behind the scenes thing, as a general rule, PR people pretty much never play the games and know nothing about them and are just given a fact sheet and they have to write up information about the fact sheet and then they send that off to be approved. So the likelihood is that was just a mistake. I mean, I could be wrong. They could be retconning this, but in all likelihood, that was just a like a mistake by the person doing the PR who saw Deadly Premonition came out in 2010, so it was set in 2010. But I think that even like his age, I think he's only 28 or something in in 2005, which doesn't make sense. Oh, did they he's say he's? Did they say um, in in the thing? Did I, they I, say I don't know. I, I I don't I don't remember saying age, but people okay. were talking about twenty eight, and I'm wondering where they got that. Yeah, because I haven't. I mean, that's not in the trailer. That's not in any of the pre press I've seen. I haven't seen so any if, references if, to him if being twenty eight. His age is given of of being in late twenties instead of thirty two yeah. or thirty one. Then yeah, there's then there's there is been a something going on. Yeah, today. No, I will agree. And with I'm going to I'm going to put this out there right now, guys. That would be a disappointment to me. Yeah, if that's true in the sequel, I'll be like, no, but, you can't change but the angel. My timeline, time. my beautiful my time timeline. <laughs> I know it's a silly reason to get, get a little bit. It ain't upset, that silly but the, reason. No, it, but 
it's like I looked so much into the the the, the story, like with all the in game clues, yeah. and I was really proud of myself that I was able to work out, you know, when this shit took place, and then have the sequel just go just kidding yeah that would be <laughs> all that stuff you figured out in the first game that would be means insulting. nothing and you would have ev- <laughs> given the amount of work you put in you would have every right to feel cheated if they decided I mean, to pull just, something like this that. the stuff they talked about like they said that the the lumber mill was the, the heyday was the 80s yep. and then when emily came to town 10 years previously which would be mm-hmm. you know mid 90s uh, oh, yeah. It closed down, and and if you go, I'm sorry, I'm gonna get a little nerdy here. If you go into the lumber mill and you look at that calendar in there, yeah, it's like from he's he he has an observation that says 1997. Yeah, some when of it the closed. like there you go. Yeah, and some of the dialogue that York even says, for example, the very very first like car conversation you have, he's talking about um attack of the killer tomatoes I know. and how it was re-released and that he he saw it came out just when he started at the bureau yep and boom 95 96 and there's your answer and it's just like and he's been in and he's so been a guy in, for this clues. many years no there's clue mm-hmm. after clue after clue that that's why uh, in case anybody listening is going it's not a big deal what the fuck is wrong with me? <laughs> this, this is this is why i'm like sweary is so was so meticulous with his details and and hidden clues and and deadly premonition and just just to have that just just kidding yeah no that's it's now 2010 and the sequel it's just like why i am not going to be i am not going to tell you you're wrong for worrying about this 100 percent. i am not going to tell you you're wrong for worrying about this i hope that that has not happened but we're going to discuss that quite a bit if they have (laughs) happened Whitney will have feelings. <laughs> you're you're going to get previewed. You're right going now. to have the very strong feelings about this, and you are not going to be so shy like, about expressing them. I'm just wondering because there's all these, like we keep talking about how richly detailed the game is, yeah. and a lot of people don't realize it because they spe- they just mainly go through the main story, yep. and there's nothing wrong with that. Let me just put there's nothing wrong with that, but there is a lot you miss. Mm-hmm. And the game doesn't do a very good job kind of pointing players in the direction to explore and or make use of certain mechanics like the observation, like ob- observing different items, yep. places, people, or, or even peeping in on people. The game doesn't make it obvious that maybe you should try doing that because it will reveal more of the plot. Yes. You're just, you go in playing it, you're just going to assume that you're going to get the whole story going through the main mission. Mm-hmm isn't the case but that it's yeah there's a whole well there's 60 percent of the dialogue in the game is not found in the main story but the fact that they spent all this time typing out all these different observations york can have about Mm -hmm. weird mundane things like observing a tree in the in the cemetery will let you know what season it is at the moment even though a texture tells you it's a Thanksgiving sale. Well, no, just just kidding. It's actually um, almost summer. It's spring. Yeah. Uh, observing, <clears throat> excuse me, a calendar or observing a food or a pill bottle. I mean, there's all these like, sorry. Okay. <laughs> there's all these little things that enriches the lore what am i what am i trying to think of? that it makes the um, it makes the world feel more complete and it feels more like yeah, a real it, place. It, it embellishes the, the the world like it's not a good looking game but if if you really want to know the nitty-gritty stuff if you're weird like me and really want to know everything about greenville you have the option to explore and observe and come to your own you come to conclusions based on those observations that are not Spoon-fed to you. It is not accidental that we have previously referred to this as the best, like, world that any game has ever had. Like, the most completely, fully built-out world a game has ever had. We're not being hyperbolic when we say that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say here, maybe I am, uh, maybe I, I have looked too deeply in the game. That's (laughs) why, like, I just feel so strongly about this. Uh, but I felt that that's what swear would have wanted people to to find this stuff Absolutely. and put put the pieces together and if the sequel just goes just kidding it, just, it would I'll, be a disappointment <laughs> and i am yeah. concerned but to to turn us back around for a second 
Uh, <laughs> Because we've gotten a little far afield, but I, I completely oh, yeah. understand your I completely understand your concern, and I one hundred percent agree with it. But as as a final thought on D four before we uh, before we go, I just I think the thing that makes me so eh when I look at D four is it will all I mean it might not always be we never thought we were going to get Deadly Premonition two so this is not a forever kind mm-hmm. of thing I'm saying but right now when you pl- try to play D four. It's always going to be this thing where the very fact that it is unsol- that it is unfinished is going to act as a barrier to people getting involved in that world. And I think that's just well, always going to be true. That's why I never wanted to play it because I knew it was unfinished. Yeah. And I mean, I had to, you know, essentially badger you into playing it for this podcast. And you're like, do I really have to? And I'm like, it's only four hours long. You can zip through it in two of your streams. Did you zip to it in two, in two streams? Uh, no, it took three. Okay, it took three. But I mean, you take your time with <laughs> this kind of thing, so of course. It took oh three. yeah, I was I was reading. Oh, another little nitpick I had was when you're reading items, yeah, and the way the text scrolled, it made it hard to read it aloud because sometimes it was just like, uh, I don't know, it just the I I didn't like the font choice right. because I, I I was stumbling over the words a lot just because of the spacing. Oh, I mean, that wasn't, anyway. uh, I didn't have that exact experience, but thinking about the fonts, I understand why you would have, totally. But I mean, maybe it's because I was reading it out loud. I think if I was just reading it to, yourself, to myself, it would, you know, it, it would have been bad. But reading it out loud, it's like, oh, shit, that's not the word. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's frustrating. All right. So uh, do you have any final thoughts for, uh, uh, to tell people yes or no on D4 before we go? Uh, well. Well, I think it's worth, if you're a story fan, I think it's worth it to play. And just the fact that we are see David's apartment mm-hmm. in the sequel. We don't know if that's going to even play into the story in any way or if it's just an Easter egg. It would be worth it, I think, to play through it. I mean, if you come this far, we've already spoiled it for you. So <laughs> what do you have to lose? No, exactly. I think it's, we have spoiled it for you. But honestly, if you haven't played it yet, it is, I think, just as a sweary completionist, as someone who wants to have a little context for Deadly Premonition 2, I think it's probably going to be worth taking a look at. And even if that just means watching a playthrough, hint, hint, watch hers. Uh, <laughs> I, watch I would encourage go, people like, to do like ballistic it. about me forgetting I put a Hitler mustache on <laughs> David and they go, oh shit, I forgot about that. <laughs> you know what? If people ask, tell them it's a Michael Jordan mustache. Because he famously <laughs> wore a hitler mustache in an ad so just like no he's a i wanted him to be a fan of michael jordan and then your eyes or, or charlie from chaplin si- or charlie chaplin there you go there's any number of reasons that aren't as sinister that he could be wearing that mustache <laughs> yeah but you you did make him look questionable i'll give you that all right oh i was like holy shit it's hitler <laughs> Let's make him look like Hitler. <laughs> oh, so terrible. All right. So um, obviously now we've come to the end. So we're going to recommend people check things out. What do you want to recommend people uh, check out? All right. So, yeah, if you're a, a Daily Premonition fan, a Swery fan, you're you're looking forward to the release, you should definitely check out. Or, I mean, you might already be watching the YouTube channel, but in case you're listening to this on the po- uh, podcast forum on spotify or whatever your podcast catcher um look up deadly permission archives on youtube and we already have um several videos mm-hmm. not as many as i thought we'd have by this point but uh um, covid19 COVID has really kind yeah, of kind of kind of fucked fuck things up <laughs> in in that regard but we are planning to have a bunch of deadly permission 2 content as soon as you know when the game's released we're gonna Buckle down. Full team coverage. Do a, Deadly Premonition yeah. 2. All day, all night. And then we're going to be getting back to our Deadly Premonition stuff after that. Yes, of course. And and also, maybe, you know, with the sequel under our belt, we'll have our new theorizing thoughts. will I be know. even better. Oh, yeah. my God. Yeah. Like, just the opportunity to find out whether what things are true and what things was were all in our head. Oh, I'm very excited about the stuff Swery is going to tell us in just three weeks' time. And we still not we still haven't gotten a actual trailer. I know, right? But we'll get a uh, release trailer soon. I mean, they did they did hint the I think was it Resident Star Games I think hint 
that a trailer is coming. Yeah. So I'm wondering if that's going to drop basically the day the game comes probably out. Probably they'll just do a release trailer next. They're probably not going to do honestly, another And honestly, though, guys, if, if, if a trailer does drop, I'd be a little wary about actually watching it yeah. until you've completed the game because... Just looking back on Deadly Premonition, their release day trailers was incredibly were, spoilery. Sp yeah, so I'd say hold off until you've actually played the we game. We are going to have a long, safe. difficult discussion about if they do a release day trailer, whether we're going to do a video about the release day trailer, because it might be spoilery. So yeah, that's something you and I, I are going to have to talk about. I don't know. I think I'd just hold off. I think I'd, okay. I mean, if it's a release day trailer, we'll just play the game. That's true. And then we can, I guess, bring it up in our Yeah, review. in our various reviews. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Okay. So, oh, and for me, uh, I just want to narcissistically tell everybody, go watch the trailer for Butchers on YouTube. It's a movie I wrote. Uh, Butchers 2020. Uh, depending on whether she wants to help me promote things, there might be a link to it in the description below this video. Oh, no, I'll, I'll link it. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, when is when is the... Do you have any idea have when the no actual idea movie's going to drop? I have no idea when it's coming out. But it's going to be direct-to-video, so people are just going to be able to watch it whenever. Okay. Yeah, so it's not going very to be Very cool. Thing. I'm very excited about it. It's a movie I wrote Yeah, that's, a while that's, ex ago. that's exciting. Yeah. You wrote a movie. Well, I mean, this is like... <laughs> technically, this is like the sixth movie I've written. But, you know. Okay. But it's still fun. Every and, this, time... and this seems like a movie that York would like. <laughs> it is unbelievably gory. I'll say that. It is, uh, it is a he very... He was very fond of the, the, of the head explosions in that in one scanners, movie. Yes. So I, I think he'd love it. You know what? I like to think that too. All right. So we'll see you back here for more Deadly Premonition podcasts. Next time, we're going to be talking about The Missing. Uh, J.J. McPhail yes. and the uh, Island of... Lost Memories? Yes. yes. Um, an amazing video game that I can't say enough good things about. Uh, seriously. It is really good. It's it's incredible. It's one of the best games of 2018, and we're going to be here to tell you why next week. Uh, but until then, I want to thank you for listening and say au revoir. Bye, everybody.